three those, things that are made worse by four big companies. So for the record, for those of you who don't understand, like people are like, oh, well, we don't even have railroads in this country or whatever. Like a lot of our system still absolutely relies. A lot of our infrastructure still absolutely relies on like, you know, gains made in infrastructure spending hundreds of fucking years ago, basically. And yes, a lot of our commerce travels through fucking railroads, okay, through trains. And, um, you know, when you, when there's a massive strike, you will recognize that, uh, you know, a big part of your lives uh, rely on that. It's not just passenger rail. Exactly. Here. Companies in the U.S. These four companies that I'm about to talk about fly under the radar of pretty much every American. But they actively shape and make our logistics systems infinitely worse than they could be. They are slow to adopt new technologies and they are always fighting any change to their industry. They uphold their terrible status quos and do not care about reducing their carbon footprints at all. Today we're going to be talking about the Class 1 railroads of the United States. All right, so for us to understand why the freight railroads actually suck. For the record, Alan, Alan is, a, is a socialist uh, a, a train boy. He's a big train fan. He's a big fan of uh, railroads and trains in general. He made that really awesome video, remember? Absolutely eviscerating, uh, uh, what was it, like Wendigoon Productions or whatever? Like, who did he destroy? That literally fucking uh, caused him to take down the video i believe he's autistic i don't know okay he's autism quote uh, coded okay just because he likes trains i don't know if he's autistic or not i mean he could be uh oh real life lore yeah yeah he he eviscerated real life lore's uh high speed rail okay uh, yeah you can steal the mr beast case yeah no, 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 take it. It, it, it. It's all Mr. Beast merchandise. Yeah, no, take it. Um, and Tawu Yapdrijakmasun. Yapdrijakmasun. Yeah, I'm sure I'm still awesome. No, what's going on? My wallet is over there. You just grab it. I got to do this. Come on. Just just grab my wallet. It's over there. Ay ay ay. Jesus Christ. Okay. RLL took it on the chin like a proper lad. Don't have to shit on him. That's true. Our real life lord did actually uh, man up and, and uh, you know, said that his video missed the mark and by a lot. affect you in the United States, we first have to go over some history of how these companies came to be. And yes, despite what you've heard, our freight rail system is actually not as good as you think it is, but we'll get to that. So we have to start at the beginning, of course. Back in the 1830s and the 1840s, railroads started appearing in the United States. Being a new technology at the time, they competed with the gold standard of transportation, which was the canal and waterway system. To get the railroads going, many states and later the US government granted not only large loans, but huge land grants were also given. These land grants not only made room for the railroad right-of-ways, but also granted large swaths of land around the tracks too. This gave incentive for the railroads to build outward rapidly, commonly selling off portions of land to settlers and new businesses along the way. This was also basically a way for the US government to kind of get companies to do the dirty work by forcing Native Americans off of part of their lands too. So that should not be understated. But later in this video, when talking about modern railroads, let us not forget that these lines would have not existed if it wasn't for the US government, immigrant laborers, and a ton of loans from each of the individuals states, but we'll circle back to that later. 
Moving on a bit in history, all of the railroads mostly did incredibly well all the way up until the 1950s and 60s. By this point, there was an obvious rift in how the way that certain railroads were operating, and that rift was a literal geographical feature, too. You see, the U.S. transportation network was split right down the Mississippi River. The railroads to the west of the Mississippi were doing incredibly well into the late 1960s and early 1970s. For example, the Burlington Northern built new coal hauling routes in the early 1970s and that made it into a golden goose worth billions of dollars. This is in stark contrast to the railroads that were operating to the east of the Mississippi, with the most ominous being the failed merger of the Pennsylvania and the New York Central Railroads. Both railroads were the largest networks in the Northeast, and when they tried to merge with each other into Penn Central, they created the largest bankruptcy in U.S. history. Well, up to that point. It was so much of a failure that the government stepped in and created its own railroad called Conrail. <laughs> A few years after Conrail's creation, the government also passed the Staggers Act, which was the first endeavor to help deregulate the industry to promote growth. The Western railroads continued to be successful, and despite many routes having to be abandoned or mothballed, the East Coast operations were saved by Conrail. But there was one consistent thing that was happening the entire time. Railroad after railroad was disappearing, slowly being bought out by its competitor. And this largely mirrors what in modern day how social media sites buy each other out. In the following decades, railroads like the Burlington Northern would buy out one of their competitors and acquire all of their tracks. The Burlington Northern bought the Santa Fe, so it naturally turned into the Burlington Northern Santa Fe, or BNSF, or the Big Orange Railroad as most people see it nowadays. Anyway, with all of these mergers, we eventually have our system cut down to only four large Class 1 railroads. Yes, I know there are some others, but they kind of don't count. These four railroads own the entire rail system in the United States. There are some exceptions, but we'll get to those later. And all of these railroads don't even compete against each other. BNSF and Union Pacific control all of the tracks west of the Mississippi, and CSX and Norfolk Southern control all of the tracks to the east. This effectively leaves the U.S. with two duopolies that control the entire rail logistics system. And even worse, most cities in the U.S. only have one railroad operating to and from that city. For example, if you had a business that needed to ship a product via rail and your business was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the only railroad to ship things in and out of the city is BNSF. So even if there is a duopoly between BNSF and Union Pacific on long distance shipping in the West, the majority of the local customers that use the railroads only have the choice of using the one railroad. In the past 50 years, this has forced many businesses to ship products via truck instead of rail, even if the shipping with rail is more efficient. I have a whole video on that here. But local shipping gets a whole lot worse when you factor in what these railroads do with their infrastructure. So, if you ever watch late night news or a television channel that only elderly people might be watching, you might run into a commercial like this where it's some predatory company trying to get you to do a reverse mortgage on your home for them. Basically allowing you to sell back the home to a bank or an investor slowly. Almost as if you're taking it all out that you originally put in to buy the house and pay off the loan in the first place. Well imagine that scenario, but it's the freight railroads doing this to their infrastructure. You see, being the wonderfully optimized capitalists that they are, they rarely ever spend money to actually upgrade and maintain their infrastructure like bridges, tracks, tunnels, and switches. They often will downgrade infrastructure to have less of it, but only later to bitch and complain that there's too much demand when it's their own fucking fault that they can't ship their own goods. There are really only two situations where they will actually upgrade or improve things. One is if there is an insane demand and they have a bottleneck for like a decade, this is what BNSF did with their main line. Or if you have a bridge that completely fails and they have to replace it. But if there's one thing to blame for the lack of care for infrastructure and slower operations, it is the implement of a practice called precision scheduled railroading. And like the title suggested earlier, it is neither precise nor scheduled and is barely railroading. PSR basically makes trains double the length and attempts to reduce crew numbers, but there's a huge catch. 
You see, in the past, you would normally ship 200 cars, like 100 to one place and 100 back the other direction. You'd normally need four trains. And because they were shorter trains, they could easily use the passing sidings to get around each other. And you could accomplish this in two shifts on one line, meaning they'd have to pay four crews to get this all done. But when PSR came into practice, suddenly you had trains that were too long to fit on passing sidings, meaning that some of the passing sidings were too short for the new double length trains. Normally, for any logistics operation, this would be a huge problem, because suddenly the line would be operating 50% slower. But, ah, this is not a logistics problem in the eyes of railroad CEOs and bean counters. You see, even if the trains are 50% slower, the railroad only has to pay for three shifts of workers instead of four. And also, because the trains can't fit past each other now, one of the three shifts usually gets to sit with a train for multiple hours waiting for an open line not moving until they clock out and have to get driven back to the yard or to a hotel. All of this just increases issues with the supply chain, exaggerating problems that already exist by making goods and freight go even slower from point A to B. This is extremely obvious at the end of the pandemic when items were on backlog and certain goods were out of stock and with manufacturers for months. Also, if you're on Amtrak and wonder why the freight trains keep getting in the way and delaying your train, this is why. It doesn't matter if Amtrak has the priority, the freight train can't physically get out of the way because it can't fit on the sidings anymore. Before we move on, I want to briefly mention that all four Class 1 railroad. Another instance where capitalism, instead of maximizing on efficiency, is just creating opportunities for companies to drive more profits rather than uh, create new solutions. And also, of course, let's not forget that the entirety of the system is on government-funded infrastructure, okay? Public funds that went to infrastructure that now, uh, now we all rely on at this stage. It could be done better, and there are plenty of examples in Europe that are adequate have refused to electrify their lines and trains, mainly because every one of them hates capital spending. And dear God, if they have to plan more than a fiscal quarter at a time, when rationalizing this seems like a no-brainer, it's the, the it's not even a no-brainer. It's, it's what needs to be done. But they won't do it. Networks like the Indian Railways are fully electrifying. The U.S. continues to use beat-up diesels, and they're not even ordering new diesel locomotives. The last large order was in 2008. They've been rebuilding them since. It's only a matter of time before a state or fuel crisis forces them to start electrifying. And no, hydrogen and battery locomotives are a scam. They are not going to work, or at least by themselves they won't. I was recently on a podcast that discussed this topic, and you can listen to that here. Anyway, let's go onwards. That's not there, brother. So, if there's one thing that every corporation loves doing, it's boasting about record profits and then immediately saying to employees that, oh, we can't pay them anymore. And railroads are no stranger to this concept. And then how workers are treated at the largest railroads in the country is a complete shame. Every rail worker is required to work roughly five days a week. But if you haven't worked for... Oh, it was like top right of the screen. Okay, my 10 bad. or more years at the railroad, you get absolutely shafted with hours. Basically, you're working five days a week. But during those five days, you have no idea what your hours are going to be until four hours before your shift, you get a message or call phoning you in for your shift. This can be at 10 a.m., 5 p.m., 2 a.m., doesn't matter. You have to show up for Let your me. shift after you get that call four hours before. You can imagine that this can wreak absolute havoc on your social life. You basically just have to give up on that during the week when you're on call. And recently, between furloughs and railroads constantly being understaffed because of mismanagement during the pandemic, workers have had enough. You might have heard about it, but in the middle of September, all of the rail workers unions were authorizing a strike. The strike was mainly asking for better working conditions, more paid days off, and better medical leave. You know, basic fucking benefits. 
For now, the strike has been averted as the federal government pushed for the companies to agree to some of the union terms, but I have a feeling that we're going to see this again. We aren't at the end of it because the workers didn't nearly get enough. Either way, it's terrible that these companies can fuck up the environment, purposely run shittier services, and treat their workers terribly. With I live in the UK and we have a similar infrastructure issues here. Sadly, we rely more on rail travel and it's deteriorating by the day. Ticket prices increasing, profits increasing, but zero investment in staffing or passenger comfort. It's like riding on a cattle truck. Yes, uh, you do understand that it's also a consequence of privatization. That's what it is in the UK as well. Um, literally, privatization. Is, that's what is the issue. You know, the Europe is just like following on the footsteps of capitalist daddy, United States of Without America. Without any threat from the government. But that's not entirely true because there are some solutions to fix our broken freight system. I wonder what he will say. So, as I said in the beginning, the U.S. does not currently have the best freight rail system in the world. Hell, not even in North America. Canada actually does it slightly better, but they've got all a bunch of different problems. Uh, if you want an example of a truly fantastic rail system, Switzerland is easily the best in the world at the moment, but that's a topic for another video entirely. Plus, you bozos in the comment will be like, but Switzerland is so small compared to the United States. <laughs> Look, there was really only one country in history that ever matched the size of the U.S. geographically. And it absolutely whooped our asses in railroad management. Oh, damn. I thought he was going to talk about fucking... I thought he was going to say China. But again, let's talk about local policies that we could enact to fix this shit. I literally First thought he was going to say China, which, by the way, also uh, getting uh, whooping our asses. Tax incentives. If the railroads are motivated by money, then let's make the money walk the walk. Let's change property tax policies to push railroads to double track again and also electrify. Then let's legally bind them to run services fast and not skimp on crews just to save a fraction of the dollar. But... If you really want to shape them up in their acts, you would scare them with the N-word. No, 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 not that N-word. We're talking about nationalization <laughs> because the government could buy out all of the property and infrastructure from the freight companies, but the freight companies can still access their routes on contract leases. I actually have a whole video on this concept and I have a second video on nationalization coming very soon. Okay, this one they didn't actually, he didn't actually video promote on this it. Concept. There is nothing here, okay? Shut the and fuck up, And I have chatters. a second video on nationalization coming very soon that's in the works, so stay subscribed if you want to see that. Either way, there are a lot of ways to tackle this issue that is the railroads in the United States. But we're just getting started. Half the battle is just informing the average person on how bad it actually is because we've been gaslit into thinking otherwise. Like I said, there will be more videos on these topics in the future, and thanks for watching. I hope that you'll stick around. Um, this was, of course, from Alan Fisher, uh, who is very good at this sort of stuff. Okay. You have such media brain. The main thing you focus on is calls to action without actual links. Okay, man, shut up. Um, he's great.